Welcome to this tutorial about basic morphology. Um, in this tutorial, we're just going to walk through sort of some of the basic terms that you need to know in order to understand um, what someone's talking about when they're talking about morphology of words um, so that you can be prepared to sort of learn more about these things by looking at more specific examples. In the last couple of tutorials, we've talked about how we analyze the internal structure of sentences. Um, in this tutorial, we're instead going to look at the internal structure of words, right? So intuitively, when we look at the word liked, um, we have this concept of liking being combined with something that tells us about when the liking happened, right? So there's some internal structure going on in the inside of the word, right? So this is not at the sentence level, this is now at the word level. Doing syntax, the smallest unit that we look at is a word level unit. Um, when we're doing morphology, on the other hand, the smallest unit that we look at is called a morpheme. And this is the smallest unit of meaning. Um, and it can be smaller than a word. And it can even be sort of not identifiable within a word. But a morpheme is like a small unit that carries meaning with it. Um, it's often smaller than a word. Talking about different kinds of morphemes, the most essential to, to understand is the root. And the root of a word is the morpheme that has the central meaning, right? So you get most of your meaning out of the root of the word. So in the word unlocked, the root would be the morpheme lock, right? Because this contributes the most information about what is going on in the action. And every other, all the other pieces of the word are sort of refining that meaning down into um, something more specific. So that's the root of, of a word is, is the central meaning morpheme. On to the root, we often get morphemes that we call affixes. Um, and these are extra morphemes that get added to the root, right? So in the word unlocked, our affixes are un and d, right? The, the d at the end is, are going to be our affixes. And there's two types of affixes that are most essential, and these are prefixes, which attach on the front. They're just affixes on the front of the word, and, af and suffixes, which are affixes that attach on the back of the word, on the end of the word. Um, but these are, uh, to be an affix, you have to be something that you can clearly separate out um, from the word. Um, and this contrasts it with changes to roots that happen in other ways. Some words, like the word mouse, um, we know that we can make a plural of this word by making it mice, but we don't know exactly what part of that word has been altered, right? We can't identify the root and a suffix. We can't identify a root and a prefix that makes that happen. And so sometimes morphemes can just sort of like stick together in a gloopy way that makes it hard to identify what's the root and what's the morpheme. And when that happens, we call this non-concatenative morphology, right? So something is happening to that form, the form of that word, um, but we can't identify uh, what change, you know, what precise piece of that word has been added or subtracted from that word, right? So, so there's morphological changes happening, um, but there's not a chunk that we can identify as being an affix. Um, and another example of this would be um, run and run and ran, right? So this is another morphological change that's happening where the morphemes can't be just easily identified. We've talked about how the function of a root is usually to provide the central meaning of a word, um, but let's talk about the different functions that can be performed by different non-root morphemes. So these are our affixes and our um, non-concatenative morphology. Um, uh, so, so these sorts of non-root morphemes can either be derivation, which take the root meaning and independently alter its meaning to make it something different. Or they can be inflection. Um, and inflection interacts with features of meaning at the level of the sentence. And so we'll come back to this. Inflection is a lot more complicated to understand than derivation. So we're going to start by looking at derivation, where you, know, you add the two meanings of the things together and you get a new meaning predictably. Derivational morphology independently changes the meaning of a word, um, and there are two different ways that you can change the meaning of a word. The first way is that you alter its syntactic category. Um, so some derivation is category altering. Um, and the other way is just to sort of change the meaning without changing its syntactic category. So let's look at some examples of both of these types of derivational morphology. 
I'll start with category altering morphology, since this is sort of more drastic. It's, it's more obvious to see what's going on. So well, let's start with this root lock. So if we want to alter the, the category of this, we first want to look at what is the category, what is the syntactic category of lock? So when we use lock in a sentence, we use it as, um, as a transitive verb. So we talk about locking something. You can't just say, I went around, I, I locked today, right? You can't say that. You have to go around locking something, so we lock the door. So it's a transitive verb. So that's the original category of the of the word of the root locked um, of the root lock. Um, and then we can apply some changes to it to alter its category. So first, let's try stick on the end a bull. So we've now combined lock, which is a transitive verb by itself, with a bull. And let's see what type of category this is now a part of. So when we use the word lockable, we would say. Um, that door is lockable. It's a lockable door, right? This has the, the syntactic distribution that we would expect of an adjective, right? So it has the same syntactic distribution as like blue, the blue door, the lockable door, right? We have now transformed the, the root lock, which was a transitive verb, into an adjective. So this is a category altering morphing. Let's look at another example of a category altering ing. Um, in, in some cases, at least, this is a category altered morphine. Um, we can use the word locking to describe the, the noun depicting an event. Now, that's sort of weird and complicated, but you can put the word the in front of the word locking. The locking of the door, right? Which tells you that it is syntactically acting as a noun phrase, right? So this has transformed our um, transitive verb into a noun phrase because we can stick the, a determiner, on the front of it and get a determiner phrase out of it, right? So we now have the locking of the door. So we have turned something that was a transitive verb into a noun phrase, um, which uh, allows you to uh, change its syntactic category. Category altering um, derivational morphology is contrasted with non-category altering morphology um, because clearly in this category, we're not going to alter its syntactic category. We're just going to uh, modify its meaning in other ways. So um, remember that lock is um, innately a, uh, a transitive verb. We lock the door, right? Um, and then add this morpheme un to the front of it, and it still acts as a transitive verb. Unlock the door. Um, it is used in the same places within a sentence, but its meaning does change, right? So we still have a transitive verb, but in this case, we're reversing the previous event of locking, right? So there was, there was, the door was locked. We are removing its lockedness, right? And so the, the, uh, the meaning of the verb has altered without changing its syntactic category. Let's look at another example. You can relock the door. We have also not altered its syntactic category here, um, but it has a new meaning where you restore a previous state of having been locked, right? Relocking implies that it was locked, it came unlocked, and then we've locked it again, right? Um, so these are these are ways that we can alter the meaning of a word um, independently from the rest of the sentence without um, altering its syntactic category. There are two types of derivational morphology, category altering and non-category altering. Um, morphology. Let's move on to inflection, which we said was the trickier one. Inflectional morphology, we have said, interacts with features of meaning at the level of the sentence. Now, that is a really confusing definition, um, so we are going to go through this piece by piece to talk about how this happens. So what happens when we have inflectional morphology is that the structure of a sentence makes it so that the forms of two words morphological markings are connected. So it's like they connect, the sentence itself sort of connects two words with each other at a distance, like they're on a seesaw together. And when you alter the way one of those words is, it's going to immediately alter the way the other word has to be marked, and vice versa, right? So you can, the sentence is what links them together, but the, the morphology is what actually alters um, based on how they're linked together in the sentence. So this is a, still a little bit confusing, um, but let's talk about some examples of, of places where this happens. Let's start with the sentence, the cow jumps over the moon. And let's look at how the words cow and jumps are linked together by the structure of the sentence. So the word cow in this sentence is singular, and the verb has this suffix s on it that marks it as being singular. 
Um, this is like putting our little seesaw in one position. This is the singular position, right? This allows both of them to coexist because they're both in singular positions. Um, now let's try another sentence. The cows jump over the moon, right? So now these two forms have both altered um, because we have two plural forms, right? So the cow now has a suffix on it um, and the plural form of jump doesn't have that suffix on it. They have these traits that they both are marked as being plural, um, which means that we've just plopped it, plopped our seesaw over in another direction. Um, let's now try to create a sentence where they don't match. The cows jumps over the moon. That has a plural form of cow and a singular form of jump, uh, which creates a sentence that is really bad. And the reason that the sentence is bad is essentially we've got two things that are linked together trying to go in different directions and it just creates a big explosion, right? So because cow and the verb jump are linked together in English because of the way our sentence structure works, they have to be marked the same way. And if they aren't marked the same way, then it's a bad sentence. So let's look at one more example of this that might help clarify how this works. In the sentence, he looks at himself, the form of the word he and the form of the word himself are linked together um, because they are both masculine forms, right? These are both uh, using a masculine uh, pronoun and so you have to use a masculine reflexive pronoun um, and, and they're linked together by the structure of this, this particular sentence. Um, you can't say she looks, you can say she looks at herself, right? So in these cases, um, we have two feminine forms, right? So that tips it to another side of our uh, seesaw. You can't have, he looks at herself, um, uh, where we have a masculine and a feminine, that just creates a bang in our mind. They, those features don't match each other, and so you're not allowed to have that sentence. Um, so, uh, so inflection shows you how two pieces of a sentence can be linked together, um, and that means that they have to have forms that map to one another. So this has been a pretty basic lesson where we've basically just gone through what the different terms relating to morphology mean. Um, we started by talking about the structure of morphemes, and we talked about how there is in every word a root morpheme, or in many words at least, you'll see that there are function words that don't even have a root. Um, but in many words, there are, is a root morpheme that carries your central meaning of that word. Um, and then there are affix morphemes, which stick on either to the front, in which case they're the prefix, or to the back of a word, in which case they're a suffix. Um, and then there are some things that happen morphologically that alter the form of a root, um, but they don't let you pick out where the affix is, what the affix is, and we call that non-concatenative. We call those non-concatenative morphemes, um, and those are like in the word mouse and mice, um, where there's clearly some plural, pluralization going on, but you don't do it by adding an affix. And then we also talked about um, the function of different non-root morphemes um, and what they can do to the meaning of a word. We talked about how derivational morphemes um, alter the meaning of a word all on their own. Uh, they don't have to, they're not linked to anything else in the sentence. Um, so we had two kinds of those. We had category altering ones, right, which alter the syntactic category, which um, alters where you can put that word in a sentence. Um, and then we had ones that just alter the meaning without altering the category of the word. So this is like unlock um, or relock, uh, where we still have a transitive verb. Um, and then lastly, we talked about um, inflectional morphemes, um, which, sh in, which show interdependence between words within a sentence. So the structure of a sentence says these two words have to be marked the same way, and then they just have to be marked the same way, right? You can alter one, but that means you automatically have to alter the other one. If you alter, you know, the second one, you automatically have to alter the first one. Um, and that's inflection, is that they're, they're, um, they're slight meaning shifts, um, but, the, but they are uh, tied to other meaning shifts within the sentence. All right, so that's morphology. Those are your basic terms. Um, in the next video, we will start talking about how we learn morphology.